I want to talk to the people in the audience who care about climate change, who are frustrated by Canada's persistent failure to reduce the amount of, argue, uh, the amount of carbon that it spews into the atmosphere. If you're one of these people, I want you to do me a favor. Look at your hand and make a fist. Now look around you and you'll see that you've got a lot of company. Think of yourselves as the disorganized majority. A strong majority of Canadians believe climate change is a serious problem, but we haven't convinced our governments to do much about it. Why? You can point to the power of the oil and gas industry. You can say that large companies have our government in their back pocket. Blah, blah, blah. You've heard this story, and it's probably true. But Canada's problem is not just the clout of polluters. It's also the disorganization of environmentalists. The sad truth is that the Canadian environmental movement is good at awareness, but bad at politics. It has failed to have a big impact on voting and elections, which is why we've never had a prime minister who prioritized climate change. Today, I want to persuade you that there's a way to put climate change back on the political map. I know there are a lot of teenagers in the audience, so I'm going to illustrate my basic idea in the form of dating advice. Let's say you're single, lonely, and you want to go on a date. One option is to go on Facebook and publicly post something like, I'm single, <laughs> lonely, and desperate to go on a date. I don't recommend this. Another option is to put your computer away, pick someone you suspect might say yes, and lavish all your charm on that person. It's never a sure thing, but this is your best bet. Now, sadly, this is a parable for the problems with the Canadian environmental movement. And the only difference is that it needs votes, not dates. And like the misguided Facebook poster, it is passive and unfocused. Now, it doesn't ask directly for votes, and it doesn't ask for them in strategic places. When it comes to elections, our biggest, best resource environmental organizations do remarkably little. Persuading people to vote based on climate change is hard enough, but when our champions when we need them most during elections, they sit mostly on the bench. This is like David fighting Goliath without a slingshot. It doesn't go well. To make matters worse, the environmental movement has developed its base in places that are not political battlegrounds. Um, the core supporters of environmental groups, the people who donate money, the people who sign petitions, the people who protest on the street are mostly urban, wealthy, and white. Basically, recruiting happens at universities and at Starbucks. This misses most voters who are in swing ridings, the places that are up for grabs during elections, many of which are in the suburbs. So preaching to the converted is bad enough, but when it comes to the environment, the converted are mostly concentrated in places where their progressive votes are needed least. In this context, it should come as no surprise to us that politicians ignore climate change. And if we can't elect politicians who actually care about this issue, we're in big trouble. Because at this point, we need to change our laws and not just our light bulbs. Let me tell you what a winning political strategy looks like. First, you organize strategically. You do some polling and look at recent history and pick 30 ridings where the margins of victory are likely to be low. Places where a few hundred or a few thousand votes are likely to separate winners from losers. Well before the next election, you hire organizers and send them to those places to gather all the people making fists. Second. You ask people to vote strategically. Come election time, 
you get stars like David Suzuki to go to individual ridings and say, if you care about climate change, vote for this person. In one place, he might support an NDP candidate. In another place, a liberal. In another place, a green. And you never know, maybe someday he'll ask people to vote conservative. The point is to reward parties that prioritize climate change and punish the ones that don't. It's possible to do this in a principled way. It's possible to be resolutely political without being partisan. Environmentalists need to learn to vote like political mercenaries who sell themselves to the lowest carbon bidder. And there will also be times when it makes sense not to vote for the best candidate, but for the least bad candidate who's capable of winning. So, to summarize, we need to create a climate lobby that follows this basic formula. Strategic organizing plus strategic voting. I think there are four reasons we haven't done this yet. First, professional political organizing is really expensive. You have to pay for staff, for phones, for advertising and printed materials. So by the way, if there are any environmentalist millionaires in the audience, call me. Don't worry about this dubious mustache that I'm growing for charity. Second, existing environmental groups don't participate in elections because they're charities. And there are laws that prevent charities from spending more than 10% of their resources on political activity. Being a charity helps you raise money because your donors get tax receipts. But if the cost of being a charity is that you can't act politically when it comes to climate change, the defining issue of our generation, this is a bad deal. Third, I freely admit that there are limits to what I'm proposing. There's, there are laws that limit the amount of money that non-political parties can spend during elections. And political scientists have consistently shown that local campaigns can only sway about 5% of voters. And to this I say, let's spend as much as we're allowed during campaigns, spend even more before campaigns, and if we can sway 5% of voters in swing ridings, you will change a lot of electoral outcomes. The final obstacle is the biggest. Let me tell you a dirty secret about the environmental movement. It is experiencing an ideological civil war. On the one side are those who think climate change is the mother of all environmental problems. And reducing carbon emissions is the number one priority by far. On the other side are those who see climate change as one problem among many. Let me give you a few examples. Nuclear power is carbon free, but nuclear waste is toxic. Hydro dams are carbon free, but they flood forests and displace wildlife. What's a good environmentalist to think? An expansive environmental agenda is contradictory. We can't have it all. And the longer we pretend we can, the less effective we're going to be. So these are the barriers to creating a climate lobby that would be a force to be reckoned with. They're significant, but not, I don't think, insurmountable. Think back to the 2008 federal election, when liberal Stéphane Dion proposed a carbon tax, the most fervent wish of climate change activists. His campaign went really badly. And while he floundered, the champions of environmentalism largely stood on the sidelines. When the votes were tallied, the Conservatives won 143 seats, the Liberals 77, the NDP 37. It looks like a solid Conservative victory, right? Not so fast. Guess how many votes separated the Conservative government from a Liberal NDP coalition? 7,174. Yes, if a mere 7,174 voters had changed their minds in 15 ridings, a liberal NDP coalition would have had the largest number of seats in our parliament, and we would have had a prime minister who actually took climate change seriously. 
7,000 votes. Environmentalists should have done more, and it could have made a difference. Which brings me to the subject of your fists, the perfect symbol of frustration and power. We're right to be frustrated, but now we need to think about how to be effective. Remember that your power to do something about climate change is in that hand when you vote for the climate. And if we can persuade other voters in the right places to do the same, then maybe we'll build the greener future you want.